can't do. I come here not as a Muslim, and I came here to learn about Muslimism and not about politics. But what does fascinate me is that the realm of suicide bombers that are going either, be it in the Middle East, be it in London, wherever, and who do it in the name of Muslim, how they can justify that to themselves and how we can, as a caring populace, change that very culture because it seems as an outsider to be so imbued in them. They don't care what it does to their families, nor to anybody else, the other people that they kill. And I think it's a very real problem for the world to try and give that sense of caring back to those disaffected people. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, that's, um, that's a, a, a great question. And you can't um, just lump all of those people into one area. I actually looked into the background of a so-called suicide bomber in Palestine two years ago to try, and it was research I was doing for a book, to try and understand what makes a young man want to blow himself up. And this particular young man, his father had cancer, but it was curable. All he needed to do was to walk out of his house, go across the road, go through an Israeli checkpoint, and go to the hospital five minutes away, every day for chemotherapy, and his cancer would be cured. The Israeli checkpoint refused to allow him through, and eventually the cancer went from being curable to terminal. Now I want you all to imagine this is your father. This is your father who's suddenly gone from having curable cancer to terminal cancer. You're watching him die. There is nothing you can do. The soldiers at the Israeli checkpoint are refusing to let him through for treatment. And I actually had some non-Muslim students from Bristol University, I was telling them this tale, and I said, come on, what are you going to do? Your father is dying in front of your eyes, what are you going to do? And one of them said, well, I would uh, write to the UN. And I said, well, that's very nice. Israel has violated and ignored more than 72 UN rules and regulations. They're not going to take any notice of the UN, not for your father. Come on, what are you going to do? And they were getting really upset and agitated. And really, one of them was nearly in tears because he could see, it's my father, what am I going to do to help him? And his father died, the most excruciating painful death imaginable because he didn't even have painkillers. I'm not justifying what that young man did, but that was his background. In Chechnya, you have the black widows, the women who also strap explosives to themselves and blow themselves up. They're using their bodies as weapons. It's the only thing they've got. If they wanted to really commit suicide, they would slash their wrists and be done. They're trying to fight a war. Chechnya is the forgotten Palestine. You look at every single profile of a so-called Chechnyan black widow. Invariably, their husbands have gone, disappeared, murdered by the Russian army. When the Beslan school atrocity happened, and over 300 children died in that horrendous situation last year, nobody would have cried harder than the Chechnyan mothers 
because in the last decade, they have lost 42,000 of their children. They know what the pain is like. And when you've lost your children and your husband, and you've been gang raped by Russian, drunken Russian soldiers, maybe there is nothing left inside and you want to fight back and you fight back the only way you think you can. I'm not justifying it, but look at the backgrounds of these people. The London bombings, the only surprise was that it didn't happen sooner. We knew it was linked to the illegal war in Iraq. And you know, We've had two minutes silence for the innocent victims, more than 3,000 in 9-11. We had two minutes silence for those beautiful young people who perished in Bali, for the people who were killed in Kenya, Indonesia, Madrid, and now London. And then yesterday, another unexpected innocent victim of the war on terror, a young Brazilian man who was buried just a few hours ago in his hometown after being shot dead by British police. We've had two minutes silence for all of those people. But what about the deafening silence of the hundreds of thousands of innocents who've died in Palestine, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Chechnya, Kashmir, Uzbekistan. You know, it's when 9-11 happened, one of the things that was played over and over again, I remember, was one of the passengers from the plane who realized she was going to die. And she picked up her cell phone and switched it on, and she dialed her home. Nobody was there, so she left a message on the answer machine. And she left a message of love to her family, it was her final words on this earth, messages of peace and love to her family. And that message was played again and again and it still brings tears to my eyes when I think of how helpless she must have felt, an innocent victim of 9-11. But just because a woman in the Gaza Strip doesn't carry a cell phone in her purse, or a woman in Kabul doesn't have a mobile, or a woman in Basra, or Babylon, or Baghdad, or Chechnya, or Kashmir, just because they don't have mobile phones in their purses, it doesn't make their life any less valuable. But unfortunately, in this unequal world in which we live, the life of a Westerner is worth so much more than the life of a Muslim. Muslim blood is very cheap. And where there is injustice, resistance is the only answer in any walk of life. Fortunately, in places like New Zealand, our resistance can take place by writing a letter to the newspaper, by phoning a late night phone-in show, by signing a petition, by marching, by voting in the elections, as long as you vote for the right candidate. Doing something, reacting, it's our duty as human beings, as people who care about justice. And until there is justice in the world for everybody, there is never going to be peace, and that is the reality.